And uh, let's start that again. Welcome everybody to our wonderful afternoon. And I'm going to say, Susan, can you bring greetings on behalf of Manor Road? <laughs> yes, welcome all everybody. Um, we have, I hope, we have this thing for you, some history of the Boar's Head Carol, the Feast of the Boar's Head. And then we'll have Victor Carrotton with some uh, Toronto nostalgia that some of us can wallow in and, oh, I remember that. And then whatever happened to that, so I hope you enjoy it. Thank you, that actually worked out quite well. And so now we're gonna share the screen and, and welcome Betty, welcome Gerald, good to see you. And uh, one second, we're just gonna go back into... So I pray you, my masters, be merry, for this is in Edna, who's joined us on the call too. Wonderful, Edna. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Doesn't it make you want to just uh, fi find a way to order that in or something, that the big feast? And again, it was an, uh, as a time to, when they used to uh, slaughter the pigs in the, in the fall some, in some places, so that was a way to honor that moment in time and certainly delight. And also, just to, as part of the whole Boris Head celebration, I remember a couple of years back uh, when I did this, I think I did it at the Metropolitan, uh, one says, where do you find a boar's head? Well, you can't always go to the butcher. You go to Chinatown, and you're guaranteed, because they, they, they often cook those. And so thinking out loud, we have also the carols that are part of that, that wonderful celebration that speak to who we are and where we can be. One second. I'm just going to go back into the links. And here we are. And so also, 
I want to show you just a bit, bit of a segment from a boar's head feast, just a, a wee segment, which is always an interesting way to see. So what do people do at the boar's head events? And then it goes back to one second, and then here we are. It's like they party. <laughs> Pardon me? It's like they party. The big party, yeah, that's that you, you hit the nail on the head, which is fun. one second. I'm just going to pause that and then go back into sharing. Okay, I'm going to screen share again. This is a, this is actually at a church. I'll show you a portion of it. And one second, just going to make sure I got it. I always have to make sure you share, share the sound. Yep, there's a sound. Good. Okay. That's when the video does weird things. One second, I'm just going to get rid of that video and it's doing weird things. Okay, good. There's always the word bandwidth, right? Okay, so you saw a sense of what can be done and maybe one day, see, Manor Road would be perfect for one of those when you think of the way our, our sanctuary is set up and when we can actually gather again in large spaces, that'll be quite something to look forward to. Now, Gerald, have you ever been to a, a Boris Head Feast? No, but uh, I know there's a large Boar's Head Feast Festival at Trinity United Methodist Church in Springfield, Massachusetts, where I've played their 48 Bell Carol on many times in their settles. And, and also in Toronto, the Arts and Letters Club. Has anyone been to the mm -hmm. Arts and Letters Club? Yes. And they also have one there too. They also have Robbie Burns. Yeah, so just one other thing related to that is, one second, I want to show you also I saw three ships, which is quite often sang at these um, events where you have a Boris Head Carol. And it's one of those wonderful carols that speaks, sort of echoes the, the Magi coming. The idea of three ships. We call it up and go there. Christmas Day, on oh Christmas Day, I saw three ships come sailing in on oh Christmas Day in the morning. And what was in those ships of three on oh Christmas Day?
There we are. Isn't that quite amazing? How I love those little lanterns they had. So when you think of, of a Boris head feast, when you think of the question I might ask people, can you have a, what memory of this time of year? And to, to uh, what, what would be the main course? Would it be turkey? Would it be goose? Uh, what comes to mind for people? Turkey. Mm -hmm. Turkey. Just pudding. Pudding. Now, oh, what, yes. what, what, now pudding is, is, is pudding, because I've heard different words for pudding, meaning sweet or savory. Was it, was it savory or sweet pudding, Papat? Sweet. Oh, pudding. Pudding. Sweet, okay. Okay. And that would be where you put a hard sauce on top of it? Mm -hmm. We have custard. Oh, yeah. oh, nice. Okay. Very nice. Put brandy about, on it and set it afire. There you go. It sounds even better by the minute. And what about you, Peter? And what about you, Judy? I'm turkey as well, and um, definitely pudding with hard sauce. Okay. And what about you, Judy? I'm not really sure. Turkey would be good. I don't know yeah. about pudding, though. Okay. It's like a steamed cake. What about you, Pat, and or Edna? Well, I said pudding. Um, oh, great. Right. Yeah. Um, well, decorations as well, like, or is this just food, please? Cover decorations are good. Yeah, that covers it. What about you, Edna? Well, my mum used to make um, plum pudding. Okay. And I'm not a turkey person, so. Uh, but I there used to enjoy the pudding. <laughs> but plum pudding is Christmas pudding, really. It's just yeah. Canadians say plum pudding, whereas we say Christmas pudding. It's just okay. got fruit does in it. Have, does it have plums in it? No. No plums. Okay. <laughs> it's it's well, faux plum. But <laughs> well, it's like it's like meat, um, mince meat pie. I mean, well, most of the time it doesn't have mint meat in it, but I mean, it's, it's, it, yeah. when it, uh, in um, Edward the Eighth's time. Yes. Had actual mince meat, but it's now just got fruit. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, there we are. Imagine that. Well, there we go. So that, that you know, if it, another day Anne will play her, her, her fiddle on this, we would have had Anne playing her fiddle and doing different things, but we'll save that for another day. But uh, now, just to, as a segue into Victor, Victor and I had met each other a couple of years ago because he posts on Instagram under, I think it's Toronto Past. Toronto Past, that's right. And he had me uh, very curious, and so I just started messaging him. And the next thing you know, we were talking on the phone, and then we met in person, and then uh, we we started doing some projects together, which included memory walls. Uh, we had we, these wonderful walls, which my friend Joe Toby donated. But we created a pictorial history of, of Metropolitan for the 200th. And one of the plans had been to develop a pictorial history of, of, of Manor Road for our 95th. That has to, well. I think by the time we, we do it again, we'll be doing our 100th or something, but, but we, we do have plans, in, in, but there's amazing photos he did call up that shows uh, the, the pre, the church before Manor Road was on site, which he made, which had, was a clapboard piece as well, which is quite remarkable. But without further ado, we have, if you want to check Victor on Instagram, he has 20,000 followers, which is quite amazing. And again, he'll tempt you with uh, things of heritage in Toronto, with the street that w was there and now what was there today. So, you now Victor, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pin you. I think I can do that. Spotlight you, sorry. So you, we have here's uh, spotlight for. Oh, there we are. That way, there. You're the main. Uh -huh. There we go. Now you're in the main view, and uh, over to you, Victor. And you and you show us the Audi Odeon Theater. Now, where is that one? So while well, the Odeon unfortunately is, is no longer there, um, <clears throat> the Odeon Theater, there is now a condominium on top of it, but that was on uh, Carlton Street, east of Young Street on the north side. So this building here is still there. It's the Hydro Building. Oh, okay. uh, this is the uh, corner, the building on the corner, which at one point was, it's an apartment building and it was next to the Westbury Hotel. And the Odeon was just down the, uh, down the way. Um, up fabulous uh, art deco uh, inspired art nouveau theater seated some thousand or 1200 people at maximum i think um 
but it was a theater that was always in hard times for some reason, um, even though it's a fantastic theater. Everyone seems to remember it. So I think they tore it down in about 1972. And there is a the Carlton Theater that's there now is actually on the same spot as the original theater, which is a little funny, but so that is the, uh, the Odeon Theater. <clears throat> So uh, we will get started into the presentation. And OK. So we're looking today at winter's past, uh, the coldest days and the warmest memories. And we're going to be looking at a number of aspects of Toronto's past um, from the perspective of sporting uh, winter sports, it's, uh, the, the focus is all on, on winters of the past, um, you know, memories, and these are uh, uh, past times that would have extended probably, you know, in excess of 100 years. And we're going to go back and look at some uh, history behind uh, these past times that we've, we've all enjoyed. Um, and we're going to also look at some, um, in, you know, photographically, aspects of Toronto that uh, I'm sure uh, many of us, uh, many of us remember, um, and things that we're missing this year as a result of, uh, you know, the current situation, but um, <clears throat> with the slide that we're starting off with are some more uh, serene scenes of Toronto when we actually had snow, uh, compared to uh, the types of winters that we experience these days. But uh, the, uh, the opening image on the left hand side is actually Queen Street looking west towards Bay Street. Uh, City Hall would be on the right hand side and uh, Old City Hall uh, would be on the right hand side and what the neighborhood that some may know as the ward would be behind that high rise building. On the top right hand corner, Castle Loma as, uh, as she looks beautiful in the winter and on the bottom right, uh, a nice photograph of Hyde Park. All of these photos date from around 1910 to about 1930. And if we go into the, okay, let's see here. This should take us into the next one. There we go. So we're gonna start off with some hard work uh, and then we're gonna get to the fun. Well, but we're gonna look that. at two winter storms, <clears throat> the storm of 1944. Bay Street. That is Bay Street, correct. Um, mm -hmm. Much of Bay Street, which is, well, no longer there, unfortunately. Um, this would be the Laura Secord was, I believe, on uh, Adelaide, I want to say. So <clears throat> now, on December 11th, 1944, the city literally ground to a halt. Uh, it, the snowstorm caused all types of businesses to close for the day. Public transportation services closed. And also we were in mid, mid war production well, towards the end of the war. Um, and even ammunition factories closed for that, uh, for those, for that day and, and, and the following day because the city was just crippled. Um, we weren't prepared at all for the storm. Uh, the forecast that was predicted by the weather, weather people were, was 12 inches of snow for that Monday. The actual amount that fell was double that. So uh, almost uh, 22 and one half inches fell. And I mean, as you can see, 22 inches is a, is a lot of snow to take in, you know, overnight. Uh, everybody from the age of 16 was helped to, was called in to help clear the snow. Uh, you know, obviously people hadn't uh, gone to work, able-bodied men, uh, volunteers, men who were on leave, everybody was tasked with shoveling. The snowstorm, unfortunately, uh, caused 21 deaths, and 13 of those were caused by heart attacks as a result of shoveling. People were uh, so I've posted this uh, about the uh, the snowstorm on Instagram and on Facebook, and one of the uh, the objectives behind the site is also creating a historical record of people's memories of these events, and uh, many people were commenting that they remember. Uh, you know, getting out of the house through the through the uh, main floor window. Uh, some person, uh, someone actually said that they got out of the house to the second floor window. I don't know. That's a little sounds like a little bit of a tall tale, but um, 
you know, the snow easily up to the up to the fence line where they could jump, you know, to the neighbor's side of the yard just by climbing on the snowbank. And uh, you know, trying to walk anywhere in the city was just, you know, it was just very very difficult. And getting halfway to school, turning around, and coming right back. So, um, this, if you, if you want to tell your grandkids that you had to walk through, you know, 22 inches of snow to get to school, this is the date to uh, to talk about. Um, so I have here a few images that I've taken from the Toronto archives, just to show the extent of the impact of that, uh, of that snowstorm. In the, uh, in the top left corner, uh, this will be uh, Queen and Young. Um, oh, sorry, Richmond, Richmond and Young Street. And um, Again, this is again the the downtown core. As you can see, the you know the snow is, is quite high on Bathurst. This is Bathurst and Bloor, where you'll remember now there's a, there's a CIBC bank, but there was a home bank here for quite some time, and then uh, it became a general store, and then CIBC took over the site again. Um, <clears throat> the streetcar had overturned from the uh, from the snow drifts. This is believe it or not, College and Bay. And so this building, this is that extension that College Park had uh, heading west from Young Street, uh, heading to, uh, to Bay Street. And this has been demolished and now there's, a, there's like a large plaza that leads into College Park. And here we have Young Street. So many of you will recognize there's that uh, building on Young Street with a very in interesting fenestration with the interesting windows, the design around the windows um, built around, uh, I believe it's 1910. Um, but that was uh, Toronto in, uh, in 44. So the interesting thing is that we are able to look at Toronto 50 years later. Um, but before we do that, I'm just gonna show you a few more images of Toronto as you have known it in from about the 20s to the 50s. And this image right here is an ice flow uh, that was actually, this is from, from Port Credit, but not dissimilar to what we would have seen uh, at the Scarborough Beach with a type of buildup that we don't see today. Uh, we see somewhat, but nothing that extends this far out from the actual, um, from the actual shore. Uh, but again, you know, I mean, these are not scenes that are, aren't reminiscent of, uh, of what we experience today, but uh, I remember the snow being, I remember 30 centimeters of snow being a regular thing, and I'm a short guy today, but I was, and I was a short kid, but I'm pretty sure it was still 30 centimeters. Yeah. Um, this actually photo on the right is from that same, uh, is actually the, this is a, a, sto a snowstorm from the 50s, and um, a lot of, uh, if, you, if, if you go to the Facebook site, even on the, on the, the website, Toronto Past, I do a lot of comparison photography. Uh, so this is actually the, if you're familiar with the Toronto International Film Festival, the TIFF building, the TIFF building is just on this side here, on the north side. So this area here has completely changed. This is King Street. And um, again, another example of, you know, the snow collecting on Young Street in 1936. It's interesting that people will ask when they see these massive drifts if uh, somebody had lifted the asphalt. Uh, young people will ask, and they don't, they're surprised to realize that this is all ice that's accumulated at the side of the road. So, fast forward from 50 years and the winter storm of 1999, where, you know, granted the snow was, you know, fairly high, um, where, you know, there was a bit of a hesitation on, uh, on the mayor's part and well, he called in the army. So Toronto was actually paralyzed by snow banks that were so high, they reached the second story of certain buildings. And what ended up occurring is that the uh, the mayor, as a result? So I'm just going to adjust my screen for one second here. Um, 
so the snow in, in certain cases was reaching the second story of, of some houses covering by shelters. And it brought outdoor sections of the subway line to a complete halt. I remember the lines had frozen over. My last one felt that his only option was to ask for help from the army. So 438 soldiers uh, arriving in, a, in an impressive array of, uh, of machinery and, and showing, their, showing military, Canadian military might. Uh, brought 128 military vehicles with them uh, on their journey from Petawawa, and they were actually stationed at Downsview. And another 110 reservists were on standby. Um, so, you know, the you you'll, you'll remember that uh, that the, the, the army came in and they were equipped with shovels and they were ready to go. They did dig Toronto out. I think it took maybe uh, a few days, from what I can recall, three or four days. The, um, these vehicles though, however, in, in defense of the mayor, these vehicles actually proved to be quite useful, especially in emergency response, because a lot of the side streets, and even until today, ambulances always have a problem with the side streets that they don't get shoveled, uh, or so, sorry, they don't get plowed, and, or they're the last to be plowed. So these, you know, in the emergency management perspective, were actually a good thing to have. So we might consider a few ambulances with larger tires. Um, as for the weather wimp title that Toronto got from the rest of the country, the city received a whopping 118 centimeters of snow during that January. However, in comparison, the following year, St. John's Newfoundland got an eye popping 648 centimeters for that winter and the army stayed home. <laughs> But uh, that, that gives us an idea of, uh, of what we were experiencing. You know, this is 50 years apart. <clears throat> now that we've gotten the, the heavy lifting, so to speak, out of the way, we're going to head to the fun stuff. And we're going to look back at activities that we've all enjoyed. We'll look back at some of the, uh, the history of those activities. And um, So I've, this is actually a, an archives photo I've always really liked. I collect uh, old photos of Toronto uh, and I like candid shots like these, which just capture kind of a moment. And it's, it's typical, something that I'm sure, you know, the, the, the wool, the wool cap, the, uh, the wool coat, uh, the sled, uh, something that I remember, I remember as a kid. Um, so I just really enjoyed the, the photo of this rosy cheeked girl building her, uh, her snowman or in, in, in politically correct terms, no person. So we're gonna start off by looking at uh, winter outdoor activities. Or we'll be looking at skating um, as well as uh, <clears throat> ice boating and an activity which hasn't been commonly practiced in Toronto for you know, over probably uh, over a hundred years. Uh, it's still practice on uh, Lake Simcoe and uh, and the likes. And so on the top left, we have uh, three young ladies enjoying a skate on uh, Grenadier Pond um, in High Park. Uh, again, the middle photo, the same thing. On the top right hand side are folks enjoying a skate on the Don River of all places. Um, and at the bottom on Lake Ontario, on thick, thick ice, ice boating. And so we're gonna look at the, the history of these various sports. What's interesting to note is that the ones that received, uh, I, also, I also collect postcards and I have a number of postcards, particularly of ice skating, uh, tobogganing up to a certain point and there's, an, there's a reason for that. And then ice skating, uh, series and series of postcards, of colored postcards of ice skating. So we'll start off with curling uh, as our uh, as our first sport. <clears throat> uh, curling originally brought to Canada by uh, early Scottish settlers and established as an organ as an organized sport first in Montreal and then to spread to southern Ontario. Initially, it was played outdoors, but uh, it had was so popular that by 1836 there was already a Toronto curling club organized. And by 1859, Toronto's first indoor rink had already opened. Um, the club actually stayed a curling club until 1957, 
when it amalgamated with the Toronto Skating Club and the Toronto Cricket Club. And it's actually still in existence today. Um, early curling stones. So, you know, early curling stones were about 60 to 80 pounds. And there are no records actually from Scotland of cur about curling. Uh, but we have records from Montreal, which tell us how the sport was uh, enjoyed early on. And uh, the photos that we have here are uh, these fine gentlemen numbered uh, 1 to 10. Uh, sorry, 1 to 11. There's actually a list of them. They are members of the Toronto Curling Club. And uh, on the right is the um, is a curling trophy and actually centered as a member of one of the curling clubs. This is actually Simcoe Curling Club. Uh, is a, a writer that had, has written a number of books about Toronto. John Ross Robertson is uh, centered in the in the middle. So we start off with curling, curling being one of the oldest sports that uh, we have enjoyed. And that takes us to skiing. Now, curling was a, was a, was a gentleman's game. Uh, high society, that's who was uh, you know, playing the sport. Uh, that's why you have private clubs. The same went for skiing. The rumor is that the uh, first Toronto skier was, an, was of Alpine and Scandinavian blood. And he carved the trails through High Park with his 10-foot skis and a bamboo pole sometime in the late 1800s. He wore a Swiss yodeling hat and a German backpack, English wool socks, and on his pioneering runs, he would yell, Yavo, through the quiet park. But uh, by 1920, uh, there was already a ski club established, the Toronto Ski Club, uh, and quite possibly by then in, in its second reincarnation, or sorry, its second incarnation. Uh, and it was so well organized that there were regular meets at High Park and Rosedale Ravine. And they were even listed in the society pages in the Toronto Star that was printed at the time under the events. And they became events that you wanted to appear at. Uh, you know, the all around civilized affair where ladies and gentlemen could be seen and hopefully would be discussed afterwards. Uh, the Toronto Ski Club actually became extremely popular. Um, the popularity of skiing in Toronto was so massive that the Don Valley became another focus for those wanting to capitalize on, uh, on the winter sport. By 1940, the Toronto Ski Club had become the largest ski club in the world with 7,000 members. So as part of this expansion of, of skiing, in 1934, the club announced that it was building a giant 30 meter ski jump on the lip of the Don Valley in Thorn, at uh, Thorncliff. Olympic skiers from across the country would power down the ramp, lubricated by 100 tons of ice that were shipped over from Maple Leaf Gardens. And they would be launched some 40 meters into the valley. And they would land at the bottom at an area that would be cleared where they expected some hundred, sorry, some 10,000 spectators, uh, which it is reported that they actually received. Um, mm -hmm. The construction of the jump cost $2,500, uh, still uh, a tidy sum at that time. While it looked unsturdy, uh, the wooden structure, you know, uh, still held fast and, um, the 65 foot high tower believed that it was capable of yielding jumps over 150 feet. The winner of the first, very first ski jump event was a 17 year old by the name of Teddy Zimkin. Uh, he was a local Toronto boy and he managed to clear a distance of 34 meters to the bottom of the ramp. Uh, by the next year, organizers were predicting jumps of 15 meters, even longer than that. Um, Unfortunately, due to the fluctuating weather and it seems that the winters were not that consistent, the Toronto Ski Club eventually ended up moving north and now they are actually, they went to, um, they're now in Collingwood, uh, but they, they, they ended up moving north to Schaumburg and then uh, further north uh, for another stop and then they ended up, which they're now in, uh, in Collingwood. Um, but the Don Valley Ski Club 
opened up after that. And uh, there was a ski resort in the Don Valley with uh, ski lifts and lift passes, uh, numbering, you know, two, five, two dollars, five dollars, uh, uh, maybe sometimes 10 to 17, sorry, an average of 10 to 17 dollars in what would, uh, in today's money. Um, and there were three runs on the, uh, at the resort. The chairlifts can actually still be seen today. The ski club closed in the 70s, but the chairlifts can still be seen today um, off of Lawrence Avenue. And uh, the photos we have here are two, uh, two jumpers, number three and number 36 um, from one of the events. And here, I don't know if you can tell, but there's a, a fellow actually taking off for his, uh, his ski jump. And this is a, an example of the 65 foot ski jump. So fairly interesting. And this is actually a photo that which here just, it, uh, it always catches my attention. Seeing that the, how popular the sport was these people have actually, so many of them have shown up just to watch people walk up and go down that hill. Uh, and they, so they're probably having some amateur races, uh, not a very long distance. This is probably taken, uh, my guess is High Park, although there's no indication in the archives and the photos. Um, <clears throat> but skiing was definitely a, a very popular path. I mean, if you look up the number of, the number of photos, the number of postcards about skiing, there are an enormous number. Um, but again, it was a more elite sport, something, uh, you know, required equipment, uh, winter gear. So only those who uh, were more fortunate would, uh, would have been able to afford it. However, something that was more affordable and massively popular, was tobogganing and again we see how popular it was by the postcard on the top left hand corner um <clears throat> the foxy quiller is the name of this uh is the name of this um sled uh, and you can see here the toboggan runs at high park and this is another one actually so this one actually runs there's uh you can see here that there's some animals these are the pens from the High Park Zoo. So this is probably, there is a, a trail that runs from the upper part of the park. And at one point in time, I would love today to take a toboggan and run down that. Um, but today, winter, most, today, a lot of winter sports are actually banned on natural services due to uh, safety and higher temperatures. But in winters past, Toronto had many bodies of water that became a skater and a, and a sledder's paradise. Sorry, have to go. Oh, goodness. Oh, it's 140 already. My goodness. Should I speed it up? Oh, you're, you're doing good. Okay. Um, so we're going to see the, we'll also see actually ice harvesting depicted. And the reason I mention it now is it gives us an idea of actually how thick the ice was on these various ponds. I mean, people still skate today, but you know, the ice on Grenadier Pond is nowhere near as thick as it used to be. Um, tobogganing was extremely popular in the 1880s. That's where actually it's, it, it began. Um, <clears throat> towards the turn of the century, Toronto experienced a, a massive increase in immigration from about 1890 until about 1905. Um, and there were concerns by reformers that the new residents needed recreation in order to avoid falling into uh, quote, disorder, vice, and delinquency. Um, so they encouraged tobogganing because, you know, it was, uh, it was an affordable way. All you needed was a sled and it could be shared. Uh, <clears throat> by 1890, the city was running programs, uh, was running tobogganing programs. Uh, by the 1900s, overcrowding became an issue on many of the toboggan runs in Toronto. And um, Riverdale Park, which was a 200 foot hill originally used by private operators and tobogganing clubs was be became public. And High Park was also a favorite. It got 
so popular that the city added lights and began to manage the toboggan, the, the toboggan runs in order to ensure their safety. Police were even assigned to supervise kids uh, by 1909. And by 1912, the system of tobogganing was drawing enthusiasts seven days a week. So here, again, again a number of photos showing the toboggan runs through High Park. Um, these are from the Toronto Archives. This is actually from my personal collection. Um, it's a series of photos showing, uh, a, it's a group of young people, I guess this, some snapshots that they had taken sometime in the 19, uh, I want to, I'm going to guess 1930s um, because in a second, I'll tell you why. Um, so probably in the 1930s, tobogganing had picked up again, although I haven't found any uh, indication of it. Uh, there is indication more in photographs than in written history. And uh, this is a, an example of the Riverdale slide from one of my postcards. <clears throat> so it looks like it was actually quite a bit of fun. I would, uh, I would definitely be there uh, if it was around today. Now, the thing is though, despite how popular it was and despite that it was meeting the reformers uh, concerns you know, for new Torontonians and keeping them busy and how, giving them something to do on a Sunday, in, from, due to pressure from the Lord's Day Alliance and we're familiar with the Lord's Day Act, City Council, Council decided to outlaw tobogganing in public parks in 1912. So the ban, immediate ban on tobogganing pushed people towards the next logical sport, which uh, we're gonna see in a second before I show you the next, the, the one last tobogganing slide because I seem to have a, a clear obsession with tobogganing. Um, but these are some more postcards from uh, from my collection, um, <clears throat> and it's a mix of of archive photos. And it's just if, if you search on the Toronto archives for tobogganing photos, there are hundreds, and it just goes to show you how popular the sport was. Um, the bottom left leads us to uh, to the next topic, but I'm going to show you one uh, very large sled in High Park. Um, I just really, uh, really enjoy this photo. Everyone seems to be having a great time. Um, and our next sport, uh, before we get to the, uh, the one that led uh, tobogganers to take the skating is actually snowshoeing. Um, <clears throat> originally a purely functional means of transport for Aboriginal peoples, it began to the, gained popularity and by the 1860s, uh, snowshoe clubs and races began to spring up in Montreal and then later in Toronto. In 1880, snowshoe gained tremendous popularity and clubs and competitions were already now popping up across Canada. Um, the Toronto Sh Snowshoe Club was born and it was born from members of the Toronto Lacrosse Club. And um, it was so popular that uh, they would travel throughout Canada and participate in what was called long distance tramps. And uh, here is a photo of the uh, of the the snowshoe club in Quebec. Now it was the snowshoe tramp was so popular that someone even wrote a song about it. And I know that you're dying to hear what it sounded like. So here is the Northwest Snowshoe Tramp, written by Alfred Bailey. Uh, I don't have a year on this, uh, unfortunately, um, but I'm going to guess probably 1880, 1890, and we'll take a listen. Will we? Just one second. Hmm. Please hold for technical difficulties. Victor, did you share your sound? Um, I, oh, I know why, okay. Because yeah, you gotta share your sound when you have your visual, yeah.
Okay, so that gives us an idea of the uh, the snowshoe tramp. And now, on to ice skating. So we have a number of, uh, of photos here in the collage from, uh, again, from the archives. Uh, one of them actually is from, is from my collection. But um, this, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of this photo here, which is uh, a lower lying area in what I believe is Christie Pitts. Um, and it just kind of showed you that wherever some water would freeze over, some kids would grab some skates and, you know, shinny would break out and um, they'd be, they'd be skating. Uh, the lot, the, the severing of, uh, of the city's programs in 1912 and the Lord's Day Act uh, out, well, uh, outlawing, if you will, uh, tobogganing, push people towards skating. Um, so skating became so huge, which was before something that was, uh, again, for, you know, for wealthier folks, uh, but it became a sport for the masses, for everybody. And you had people of all Toronto, Torontonians of all levels enjoying themselves here again on the, uh, on the Don River, which would freeze over completely, um, you know, racing, kids causing trouble as usual by uh, hanging on to the backs of cars with their skates while the cars would drive them around. Um, and um, there were a number probably, I wanna say about uh, the turn of the century, at least 10 to 15 outdoor rinks uh, that were city managed. And then a number of uh, rinks that were just, you know, created by, uh, by folks on their own, by just pouring water. And the same way we would make a hockey rink in our backyard when I was a kid. Um, but ice skating in, in itself goes back uh, 2,000 years to Scandinavia, where it was just simply used for transportation. Um, but we, you know, we took it uh, one step further from, from use in industry into, um, you know, utilizing it and, and enjoying it uh, in the winter time. And we would skate on anything, anything, uh, lake, rivers, ponds, lakes. There was skating on Lake Ontario. And uh, skating was so influential in Canadian sports that we became top champions. And um, but many of these images, you can tell that the, uh, the feeling is already there. Um, so skating obviously led to figure skating, which again, Canadians are fairly well, you know, we're probably if not the not the if not the best that we are definitely the, the top competitors internationally. Um, and you have here a uh, where is it? A female skating club and a mix of male and female dancers um, <clears throat> practicing. Actually, here they're practicing. These are most of these photos are taken at um, Varsity Stadium or Varsity Field. Varsity Field and Varsity Stadium. And again, it was so popular that. It was depicted on postcards. So, as I said before, kids would pick up wherever they could squeeze in and uh, create a game. There was a nice hockey game being played. <clears throat> there was even skating on the uh, on the lake, and you'll notice that this is at um, St. Lawrence Market is actually right over there. So this heritage building still stands today and the railway ran right here. And this that was the waterfront at that time. So uh, the waterfront was actually on Front Street. So Front Street runs this way, but you know, you can see how thick these, uh, these boats are there. Uh, and you know, obviously the, the water, the ice has been broken in order, in order for these boats to, uh, to dock. Um, but the ice was thick enough for the, uh, for the ice boat. So this would be pre-1912. From skating, that naturally leads us to ice hockey, the, uh, the most iconic of Canadian sports. 
which is thought to have developed from older ball and stick games like uh, bandy, shinty, Irish hurling, and field hockey. The first hockey game played in Toronto was nine skaters of the home side from the Granite Curling Club who met nine equals from the neighboring Caledonians on February 6th, 1888. And that was the, uh, the quote unquote, the big bang for the center of the hockey universe. It was the first organized hockey game in Toronto involving proper sticks, two sets of teams, coded rules, an indoor venue, um, and most notably, newspaper verification. Uh, it was a four win, sorry, four to one win for the Granites. And uh, if there was any post game traffic jam on Church Street, it was probably all horse and wagons. And there were no, uh, no call ins to the sports shows to complain about anybody's performance. And um, I hope everybody kept their teeth. I don't know. But um, the Granites would, uh, were the ones who played the very first organized hockey game in Toronto in 1888. Now, it wasn't the first time a game similar to hockey were play, uh, was played. There were other forms um, that were played uh, around town long before the winter of 88. There are scenic paintings uh, from the 19th century that show a variation of a hurley and a stick game called shinty uh, among uh, sleigh riders. Uh, Christmas carolers and, and pleasure skaters. So there are indications that there was some sort of a of some sort of form of hockey that was being played. Um, but you know, this, so this is 1888. Within two years, there were already hockey uh, female clubs that were being set up in the beginning of the 1890s. So it just exploded in popularity. Um, the first competitions were played by university teams. And um, in the 1920s, the Amateur Toronto Hockey League included both senior and intermediate teams for women. So it's, uh, it's fairly interesting that we see the, uh, the Royal Bank of Canada sponsoring the Intermediate Ladies Champion Toronto Hockey League. And this is a, a, a group shot, a shot of the, of the group here. And again, some, a sport that was so popular that this was probably, I would say, dated around 1910, this postcard, depicting women playing hockey, playing ice hockey. Um, so it wasn't just a game for the boys. And now we move on to ice boating. So ice boating was a sport that was immensely popular in Toronto. Um, as early as 1824, a gentleman by the name of Isaac Columbus set up a shop at Duke and Sherburne and began advertising his ability to, among other things, repair the irons of an ice boat. Um, the sport flourished in Toronto. It originally uh, came from, it's believed that it, it came from Norway. Um, it was definitely a northern sport. Islanders um, and mainlanders took to the sport. By 1840, people were building their own boats. Some people with the means to do so were, uh, were having them professionally built. But it was, you know, the, the design the Torontonians were using was fairly consistent, simple design from a 17th century version of an ice boat called a Holland, uh, which was basically a triangular, flame, a, a, a triangular frame with skate blades. Uh, I mean, to me, it looks like a, it's a small... It's a small sailing vessel um, with, uh, with blades on it. Uh, but Toronto boats were simple enough. People could build their own. Now, of course, uh, once boats were discovered that they could exceed 100 kilometers an hour, sportsmen turned them turned to racing them. And so they would race them on 10 to 25 kilometer circuits out from Toronto into the lake and back. Um, now, again, another aspect. So first we had sledding, which uh, was, um, which ended basically in 1912 with the Lord's Day Act. In 1911, the Toronto Harbor Commission decided to take on work in the harbor by dredging, uh, you know, new, um, 
new positions for, for some of the boats and dredging parts of the harbor. And that resulted in shifting currents. So as a result of that, ice no longer regularly formed in the Toronto Harbor. So the reason ice doesn't form in the Toronto Harbor is not because of global warming, but it's because of the warm currents of the water that are coming into the harbor. And that's the reason we don't see the level of ice. Um, and we're going to see exactly how thick it was before um, because we were even harvesting the ice. So when they were harvesting, they were you know, ice boating, people were recreationally using the ice and they were breaking the ice in order to get to the islands. So, you know, there was a, it was quite a difference. However, that shift in 1911, uh, the shift of the currents makes, uh, makes a difference today. And I'll show you a picture uh, in just a moment. But there was one gentleman who was dedicated to the fact, um, William Buckland, and he basically, he sued the federal government for taking away his ice boating. And uh, whenever he would meet a politician, he would say, I, I see we still have no ice boating on the bay. So, um, I so sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote. His, his quote was, I'm just going to pull it up. Um, I see we still have no ice boating on the bay. So I presume that you are still in the higher of the pool rooms. Um, that was one angry gentleman. Uh, there was a brief, a brief resurgence uh, of ice boating when the harbor froze over in 1944, and uh, they used it in order to raise funds for the uh, for the war effort. But I'm going to show you the next example. That's so. On the right hand side is a photo of the bay, right? And how I mean, you can imagine that. You know, these guys are coming in from harvesting ice, right? This indication of 1920 has got to be incorrect because we just learned what we learned uh, about 1911. So I might even let the Toronto archives know. But um, we've got ice boats here uh, and we have people coming in from with, uh, with, uh, with sleds from harvesting ice. Now, if you look at the approximate same area, which would be right around where the harbor front is, there, this photo here is actually probably taken about here. And you'll notice that just the buildup of ice is not as thick here as it is on, in these photos. And there are other aerial photos which indicate the same thing. And you'll, you'll notice here as well that it starts out from the island and the ice starts to creep in. So only by the time, so there must be some sort of a current, I'm not sure which way it's coming, um, that is keeping the area around the front um, fairly, uh, fairly liquid, in a liquid form. But it wasn't only sports. Uh, winter was also about transportation. And we had to figure out ways to, uh, this is, these are all pre-automobile. So again, sleighs uh, or sleds were so popular that um, they're depicted in postcards like this one showing uh, two of, and two, actually three of them in front of Queens Park on a, on a snowy day. They were also used for delivery of groceries and household goods. This would be uh, to the annex. Transportation. Um, these closed type of cars, the, the, the ones that were used in the summertime would have been open cars and delivery of ice. So here is a horse drawn sledge with uh, blocks of ice. And we're going to be looking actually at ice harvesting in, uh, in one or two slides. But um, the sleds in themselves, they date back to ancient Egypt. The Egyptians used the concept in order to drag stones, in order to construct the pyramids. Um, the carriages date back to 3000 BC in Mesopotamia. So, you know, it wasn't, uh, wasn't long before they would swap the wheels off and throw on, uh, throw on some, sl some sledges. Um, the oldest sledges that have been found 
were found in 1904 on a Norwegian ship called the Osberg. And though the contents of that ship date back to uh, 800s, uh, common era. So around the year 800, that's, those are the oldest sledges that we've seen. Um, and so the next we're going to look at is ice harvesting. So now for those who remember having an ice box, this is where the ice came from. Um, before ice could be artificially created, it would be cut in the summertime, uh, sorry, in the summertime, in the wintertime, and it would be stored in, uh, in ice houses. And uh, some of the sources were Grenadier Pond in High Park, Lake Ontario, uh, Yorkville had a, uh, had a large pond, Swansea, uh, a number of locations. And um, ice cutting started early on in, in Toronto with the Ashbridges family cutting ice in Ashbridges Bay. Uh, but the by the 1850s, there was quite a bit of competition in ice cutting, and it was even uh, a business where um, <clears throat> Black Torontonians were found uh, were had opened businesses as well. Two of the more prominent ones, or sorry, one of the more prominent businesses was opened by the Carey brothers, who were a family of uh, Black entrepreneurs who had moved to Toronto from Virginia. In the 1830s, is so they had originally opened up barber shops, and they decided to get into the uh, the ice harvesting game, and uh, they ran a successful company for uh, about 20, 30 years. Um, but again, you know, there was a a lot of competition. But ice fields were uh, basically cultivated. So what they would do is they would basically pour water, and they would pour warmer water, and they would build up the ice in order to be able to harvest it. And so there was actually so much work put into ice harvesting. There was even a manual issued in 1912 on the subject, which I found in the, uh, in the National Archives. And here's another image of um, ice harvesting taking place. And so they're basically, they're cutting it from the lake shifting it down and then putting it on the conveyor belt and running it into this warehouse. And so the warehouses would typically be built right next to the water, body of water, where they are housing them and they would run air. Um, they were metal uh, rooms that were built out of wood insulated and then covered in metal so that the ice would last uh, into the springtime and into the summer. Now, of course, one of the I, one of the things that we remember and that's been happening every year, unfortunately, except for this year, is the Royal Agricultural Winter Fair, which started actually in nineteen in nineteen twenty two, um, and now it's it's expanded and it takes over the Enter Care Center and still remember it's a, it's an important exhibit for livestock breeders uh, in Canada. Um, but it is the largest indoor agricultural fair in the world and was actually the largest at that time. Same way Toronto had the largest industrial exhibition in the world, we also had the largest agricultural fair in the world. Um, and the history behind it is, is fairly interesting because after the First World War, uh, Canada was, you know, it's where Britain was establishing itself as a supplier to the world. Canada being uh, under the British Empire was um, providing the supply. Um, but a group of farmers led by uh, a gentleman by the name of W.A. Dryden from Brooklyn, Ontario, um, sought to create a national agricultural exhibition, partly to set national standards for the judging of domestic animals. And so with a, with a group of other farmers, he formed the Agricultural Winter Fair Association of Canada. And by 1920, they got permission from King George uh, to use the prefix royal. Um, and so it had grown from the 1920s into the 1960s where we ended up with some 75,000 people uh, a season uh, visiting and viewing the Royal Agricultural Winter Fair. Um, and it you know grew from just cattle to uh, any type of animal you can think of, large turkeys, 
um, uh, cattle, cats, dogs. I've seen every animal possible. Um, and then also, as well as, you know, uh, winter, winter gardens uh, were exhibited and um, were placed in competition and what appears to be some square dancing. So I didn't know the square dancing took place at the, uh, the winter fair. And of course, uh, you know, Christmas when, or this, this part of the season would be incomplete without the imagery of Santa. Um, and, you know, old St. Nick has, has brought bright eyes and teary ones to the kids over the years. Um, he's become part of the culture, if you will say, part of the culture of Christmas. Um, you know, the same with the presents and the trees, which come from, from Norway. But when I think of Santa, I think of the Santa Claus parade, the one that was started by Eaton's. And so we'll take a look now at the uh, Santa Claus parade. I remember this as a kid uh, and I remember frankly losing my mind every year when we were, I would be so excited that we were going to see the Santa Claus parade. The, uh, Santa Claus Parade annually held on the third Sunday in November. Um, <clears throat> about half a million people attend the parade every year. The first one was that, that the first the first one was held in 1905, um, and it is one of the largest parades in North America. It's the oldest Santa Claus Parade in the world, and one of the oldest annual parades in the world as well. The total route is about 5.6 kilometers. And the idea from the, for the parade originated from an earlier promotion by the Eaton's chain of in, uh, in 1904, where Santa walked from Union Station to downtown, to the Eaton's store downtown. And it was, it was so popular that Eaton's decided it would be a great way to advertise. Um, so they started with uh, one float in 1905, December 1905. And they were sponsored by Eaton's where they collected donations and, you know, for charity, they collected presents. They delivered the presents from Union Station to the downtown Eaton store. Um, the parade eventually grew uh, so that there were parades in 1910 and 1912. Um, the Eaton's parade in, in 1913 even brought reindeer from Labrador in order to pull Santa's sleigh. Um, but a 19, uh, until 1915, the parade was followed by Santa holding court at Massey Hall, where he would meet up to 5,000 children. By 1917, the parade featured a number of floats, and in 1919, Santa arrived in the city by plane. From 1925 until the 60s, the floats from the parade were reused in Montreal, uh, where Eaton's had been holding Santa Claus parades since 1909. And it was a reoccurring character starting in 1947. I don't know if anybody remembers Pumpkinhead. Um, and he was seen each year at the parade and Pumpkinhead was a character in a series of storybooks sold by Eaton's. So we can see how Eaton's is utilizing uh, the parade to, um, to continue advertising themselves. By the 1950s, the Toronto parade was the largest Santa Claus parade in North America. And um, Eaton's continued to pay for the parade, which, you know, advertises retail business. Um, in 52, it was first aired on television. And in 1970, the first color viewing. And so I've included a few photos here where uh, I remember this, doing this as a kid where I would just, I don't know, the kids are just so happy. Um, <clears throat> this is University Avenue. Um, I'm pretty sure I remember these floats actually. I remember standing in front of, uh, this is actually um, Honest Ed's, right? You can see from the, uh, the sign, don't just stand there. That's what everybody's doing. Uh, but the kids are all seated, eagerly awaiting uh, Santa Claus. And uh, the Santa Claus parade always meant that Santa was just uh, you know, a month away and presents were around the corner.
So I put together this other collage and I have a, a video clip of Pumpkinhead, which will play right now. So one of the other uh, aspects that I recall of, whoops, winters in Toronto. Let's go back one more. Um, are the roasted chestnuts. And it's something that we occasionally see today. Uh, there are one or two carriages that I've seen out. Definitely, you know, the I remember the, the smell coming out of the theater uh, when I was a kid and we would go to the theater on a Saturday night and the smell of the popcorn, the peanuts, the, uh, the, the chestnuts, uh, of course, the toys for kids. Um, but it was, it, was, it, was, it was interesting that I had posted this image uh, from a Toronto photographer of this gentleman at the corner of Young and Dundas sometime in the 1960s. You can see the Brown Derby bar right across the street here. Um, and, you know, we were discussing what had happened to uh, the roasted chestnut vendors, where they had gone. And the, the discussion fair, you know, basically centered around the fact that most of them were immigrants, most of them were Greek, uh, Greek and Polish background, and they simply could not compete with the clout of the Young Street businesses, which were complaining that these vendors were, you know, potentially stealing their business, even though they weren't selling chestnuts uh, or anything similar but uh, they still did not like them, you know, having them around. And in the 1950s, I think it's implied that if you, uh, if you made a complaint to the police, they might, you know, rough someone up a little bit and get them to move out of the way without actually filing a report or anything like that. I don't know how true that is. Um, that is from the grandson of one of the vendors. That's what they, they claim that um, they were kind of, you know, pushed off of Young Street, uh, pushed towards Bloor Street, uh, towards Queen Street. As a kid, I remember them on Queen and King, uh, maybe at Young and Nundas, but uh, maybe at the end we can also, uh, if you have any memories, I would love to hear them if you, you know, where you remember seeing them. Um, that helps me put together a, a narrative of the, of the city's history. But in looking at uh, vending, you know, or the, the, the roasted chestnut man, which reminds us of winters in Toronto, it's also an opportunity to look back at the uh, actual vending, the history of vending in Toronto. And street vending started actually in Toronto at the turn of the 20th century in Kensington Market. So hand carts were, were pushed by predominantly Jewish merchants. And um, that's how the neighborhood actually got started as a, as a marketplace. Um, it would seem that we've come a long way since, but the truth is that Toronto street vending is only just entered its, uh, its renaissance with the, uh, with the you know, recent introduction of the food truck in recent years, loosened regulations, um, now have allowed the roasted chestnut man to return. Um, you know, and uh, it, it, it should be interesting. There are actually, there is one company that has the original carts from 50 years ago, and that's what they use when they go out. And if you go down to, um, if you go down to Harbor Front on a summer's day, I've seen them the last few summers. They were out uh, selling balloons and popcorn and, uh, and hot peanuts. Um, maybe we'll see them around for, uh, I'd, like, I'd like to see a roasted chestnut man out in December, just once. Next is the window displays. The very well known Eaton's and Simpson's windows displays. So 
this is actually from a store uh, a little bit further down the street, but I think it's just a fantastic display. Um, it's not as uh, as uh, story like as Eaton's is, uh, but it, uh, it it gives us a place to start. So it was originally Macy's department store uh, on 34th Street in New York that in 1874 was the first to decorate their windows in the Christmas theme. Um, prior to that, they had stayed open until midnight one Christmas Eve and creating the first Midnight Madness sale. Um, after Macy's did that, they kind of changed the way uh, Christmas was, uh, was carried on in North America. In Canada, the main rivalry for extravagant windows were, of course, between Simpsons and Eaton's, um, which were the largest department stores at the time. And they typically played it safe by just displaying merchandise, so similar to this window here. Um, but in 1945, Eaton's was you know, probably feeling gutsy. And they decided to, pl to play religiously themed carols over a loudspeaker to accompany their displays. Uh, church leaders loved it, and they encouraged them to continue with these uh, with the music and the displays. And the windows began to attract more attention, and suddenly there were nativity scenes and wise men uh, all over the place. Um, after the war ended, the uh, Second World War, after the Second World War ended, there was a surplus of, uh, of, of motors. So Eaton started having motorized displays uh, because we had just, you know, surplus of motors from the Second World War and soldiers who knew how to, uh, to run and fix them. So here's uh, four snapshots of the window displays. And it's interesting to, 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 to note that families drove for hours. So they would come from out of town. Uh, I, I don't know if everybody uh, listening today is from Toronto, but um, I've heard of families, I've spoken to people where families would go from, come from out of town in order to go to downtown Toronto to see the windows at, uh, to see the Christmas uh, displays. Um, so cow, crowds gathered on the streets uh, until 68. Eaton's drew their blinds on Sundays, but then after that, they started to open them up. Um, but it was so popular that uh, the city officials had asked Eaton's to limit the number of hours that the public could view their windows because they were blocking the traffic on Queen Street. And as they would cross from, uh, from, from the north side of Queen to the south side, they would just basically block all the traffic. So 90 years ago, the Globe illustrated the annual pilgrimage of shoppers to the Christmas display windows of downtown's consumer temples with the pros as colorful as the holiday lights. And the, this is a quotation. There's a peculiar, pardon my pronunciation. There's a peculiar fascination in Christmas window shopping. And for the lucky beggar whose purse is at once portly and elastic there's a stimulus in leisurely stroll along the main thoroughfares, gazing upon the window displays flaunted through polished glass plate. On a pre-Christmas afternoon, the purple twilight shattered with shafts of rosy light gleaming from a thousand meteor lights illuminating the shopping district of the city. Men and women, boys and girls loitered in the glare, finding appeal in the magnificence of the Yuletide exhibit. Um, and it wasn't only Queen Street. Uh, Eaton's also had uh, Christmas windows at their College Street store. Um, this may be a bit of a, a setup on my part. I don't know that this baby was necessarily looking at this display, but um, it is the, the, the photo of the uh, of, of the of the youngster actually is from uh, from Eaton's as the youngster is looking through the uh, the windows of the display. But um, in a in an interview in the with the Toronto Star of the 1980, uh, the Simpsons window designer uh, was quoted as saying, "A display success was determined by how children reacted to it. It was great to watch them from behind the display." He says, "You knew you had done a good job when they had their eyes wide and their mouths open." And their noses were pressed against the glass as they pointed at things. 
the one time that spectacle was not eye catching was when uh, the things were the motors had overheated and the displays began to melt one year. Um, when Eaton's display replaced its two downtown stores with Eaton Center in 1977, the old window props were sold and limited window space along Young Street reduced the scale of the displays. So Simpsons briefly abandoned it, uh, but when it was purchased by the Bay in 79, the Bay started doing it again. Um, and now if you go by Bay and the Saks Fifth Avenue stores, uh, Queen and Young, you'll see that the, uh, the tradition still continues. I don't know about this year, uh, because frankly, I have not been down there very often. Um, definitely not uh, this season, but uh, I know it was there last year. So here's the shot of the uh, of the window displays in, I would say, probably judging by the cars, the 1960s. Um, the toy, the toy town photo on the left, based on the toys, I would judge to be from the 1970s because we have a Star Wars item there. Um, <clears throat> These are four slides actually that I, uh, I purchased from, uh, from a collector a few years ago. And they don't, they're the only slides that I, that I have of uh, some sort of a depiction of Young Street in the, uh, in the winter time showing the windows. And you can see there the Christmas tree and star and that's the Young Street with the, uh, the Fox Theater Now, I don't know if anybody remembers Dallard's, am I pronouncing it, next to Reitman's. I'd be curious what this store is, if anybody has any ideas. Dallard's or Daylard's. And Young Street, the way it used to be decorated. This is uh, Young and Gerard Street. And Judging from the buses, I would say this is probably the 1950s, but um, this was typical. I think I even remember this style of decorations for Young Street when I was a child. And um, it's not something we see anymore, unfortunately. Um, I think it would be quite nice, but people are usually, are, are usually quite impressed by this photo as to how many lights there were in the city versus uh, what you see today or what you don't see on the subject of Christmas and Eaton's, we can't go without talking about the Eaton's catalog or the Simpsons Sears and the Eaton's catalog. And, um, whoops, sorry. So originally the Eaton's catalog Uh, started out as a 32-page book in 1884. Um, by 1920, it grew to a 500-page catalog that was distributed across the country. Um, and in 1887, Timothy Eaton was quoted as saying, this catalog is destined to go wherever the maple leaf grows throughout the vast dominion. We have the facilities for filling mail orders satisfactorily, no matter how far the letter has to come and how good how far the goods have to go. Um, Eaton's reevaluated its, its practices uh, in the 1950s when Simpsons and Sears uh, joined forces. And uh, by the mid 1960s, when Eaton's was already dwindling down on producing their own goods, um, by the 1970s, the Eaton's catalogs were unpopular. Uh, most towns had a, a shopping center that you could go to mail order wasn't that popular anymore. So Eaton shut down his catalog business. But the funny thing is, is that when they did that, Simpson Sears catalog business tripled. So um, I don't know exactly what their stats were, but uh, it was definitely a good thing for, for Simpsons. But if you look at it in the, from the perspective of population, 
In 1900s, three quarters of the population lived in rural areas outside of metropolitan areas. And by the 1970s, the population had shifted so that three quarters of Canadians lived in metropolitan areas versus living outside. Um, so, you know, it wasn't just, wasn't a viable, uh, a viable, uh, you know, a viable way for, for Eatons to continue. And also considering that, you know, within, they would find themselves within uh, some, some definite difficulty within the next, uh, you know, 10 to 15 years. So I'm sure everybody remembers the milkman. You know, you see him depicted in movies. The milkman was gone by the time, uh, by the time I was born. However, I do know, I, I remember that we had a place where milk could be delivered uh, just next to the uh, front door when I grew up in Willowdale. And our house was built in 19, I want to say 1947, 48. And there was, you know, that little room there on the side door where uh, the, you would place your empties and the milkman would place the, uh, the full bottles or delivery at the front door. But, um, you know, it's not unlike, the, not unlike something we see today with grocery delivery. Uh, there were milk, eggs, meat, bread were delivered uh, in the early morning by horse-drawn carriage around Toronto. And that happened into the 1950s. Um, I have uh, I have photographs of delivery of horse drawn delivery in Kensington Market into the 60s of fruit and vegetables. Um, but the milkmen obviously, you know, they they worked for the local dairies. Um, those dairies eventually evolved into many of the convenience stores that we see. Um, but you know, some companies actually. Uh, moved ahead in technology and they replaced their horses with uh, electric trucks and then eventually uh, with, uh, with gas powered trucks. So about 1889 is where they, start, they started moving towards uh, motorized vehicles. Um, but, you know, it was very, very common to leave a gift for your milkman. Uh, it could have been a Christmas card, cigarettes, chocolates, um, there was uh, something that I saw a few years ago where someone had left uh, uh, toilet paper for their for their milkman, which is an in interesting gift. Although in 2020, it's very applicable. Um, and here is a, a postcard from my collection showing a Toronto residence in the winter time. Now, I have been unable to place this actually. Um, this corner. So uh, if anybody has any any interesting ideas, I would be interested in hearing them. My uh, my search through the Toronto archives, this kind of Italianate architecture, I have not been able to place the location of this residence. Uh, I had always thought it was in the annex, but um, I decided to put it up in case anybody uh, might recognize it. And it's also showing a residence in, in wintertime. Of course, no Christmas would be complete without the Christmas tree, like the one that we had every year at uh, City Hall. Uh, by the 1950s, decorations had started to expand. And uh, as the lady on the right-hand side uh, is depicting in the photograph, people started decorating their lawns out front and inside the house, outside of the house. And last but not least, you could always pick up in 1908 a Christmas, hold on a second. What you, I don't know if you can see it, but this is a deer. And the entire store has deer hanging outside of it. So it makes me, uh, makes me think that in 1908, deer was very popular for Christmas that year. And um, although this is 1913 and they're seated for uh, a nice Christmas dinner, uh, it's uh, distinctly possible that there is some venison there. Um, and that brings me to the end of my portion of the presentation. I do have one more slide, which I will just tell you a little bit about 
what uh, what Toronto past is all about. And so part of what I do is what's called rephotography. And I will take uh, an original image that I have in my per in my in my personal collection. So this is uh, 120 Beverly, sorry 121 Beverly in 1908, and it's a real photo postcard. And I reshoot it. This was actually the home of William Lyon Mackenzie King in the 1890s when he attended U of T. Um, I believe this fellow right here to be his brother, who both of them were in town campaigning uh, for him as he ran for uh, prime minister. Um, and it would not have been uncommon for them to visit the old house that they used to live in. Um, this is another comparative uh, photograph re-photography that I, I done with um, about this young man who lived at number 47 um, and he, sorry, oops, I got out of it. One second. He actually survived nine tours uh, during the first world war and um, he lived at uh, on a on a street in Toronto called uh, Roehampton, and uh, the you know the house is still there today. The uh, I presented a few uh, a few a few years ago at a at a society at a at a historical society, and it turns out that one of the people in the uh, in the audience knew his knew him actually and knew his granddaughter, so she had placed me in touch with the granddaughter. And I was able to interview the granddaughter about the gentleman uh, depicted in the photo. So um, I provided my phone number in case I, in case anybody has questions. Uh, my email as well, Victor at Um, Plugs for the Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Toronto Past, everywhere. The whole idea is I I'm using social media in order to promote uh, an interest in Toronto history. And so what I do is I'll create narratives every week. We pick a subject and we visit that subject the same way we did today. Um, I do that on a, on a daily basis through social media sites. And that wraps it up. That was amazing. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I hope, does anybody have any questions? I've got there, some uh, slides you might be interested in. I'll have to dig them out, but they're from a Santa Claus parade from like 1962 back at the corner of Bedford and Davenport. Where they oh, used yeah, to, absolutely. Used to be yeah. A, uh, super test station there. Yep, on the southwest corner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, there was one on the southwest, and there was a gas station on the southeast corner as well. Yes. So, Victor, can you stop sharing your screen so we can see people's faces? Oh, sorry. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, it's at so. the bottom. Here. Okay. Great. Okay. And I'm going to stop recording so we can just, uh, because uh, otherwise it takes a long time to.